we're sitting down with Craig Robinson, who's the author and illustrator of Flip Flop Fly Ball, which is an infographic baseball adventure that has, uh, in some ways, taken the UK by storm. You have a bit of a cult following here in the UK, Craig. Um, and we're lucky to have a moment of your time as you're traveling to London from your home in Mexico City. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, flip Flop Fly Ball. Um, l let's be clear for a moment mm -hmm. about who you are, uh, which Craig Robinson you are, because there are other Craig Robinsons that are probably known to some of the people listening in, one of whom is on The Office, I think, as an actor. Yes. That's uh, not you. That's not me. And another was a baseball player as well. Uh, yeah, played for the Braves and the Phillies, I believe. Yeah, and that's not you. That's not me. Um, you are an Englishman and an illustrator by trade. Correct. And how did you get into baseball? Um, I was on business in New York uh, in 2005. Um, and I was staying there for a couple of weeks. And I spoke to colleagues and asked them about... Uh, I'd seen like uh, I'd seen a couple of innings on television, and it was just a bit confusing. So I asked them if they wanted to go to a game because uh, you know the, the I knew that the uh, the company I was working for had some dealings with the Mets, so I figured it'd be easy to get tickets. As it happened, the Mets weren't in town um, that week, so we ended up going to the Yankees game against the Twins, I believe. Um, and it sort of it was it all kind of made sense in front of me when when I sat there and wasn't watching on TV and you can actually see the whole field and mm. you can see the speed of the pitching and and you also have two people there to actually answer all your stupid questions about you know <laughs> why is it only three people have to be out mm. you know because I was used to cricket the word inning or innings for me was a cricket thing so um, it was confusing that only three had to be out in each inning um, but once that got explained um, it just made sense in my head well, it's a big leap, I think, from figuring out how many uh, how many batters need to be out before the inning switches over to writing some very technical infographics about the game and the history of the game and the current state of the game. Um, I mean, how long did it take you to write flip flop fly ball? Um, it started. I started doing the infographics uh, very soon after that first game. Like once I was living in Berlin at the time, and once I got back, um, I realized that I. I couldn't just know about the present day game. I would have to learn something about the past, and um, I think baseball's past is is particularly wonderful in sports in the fact that it's sort of you can't watch a day's worth of baseball without the past being referenced at some point. Mm. It's, you know, the past is part of the present in baseball. I feel um, so having to learn these mountains of information about old players and old teams and where they used to play. It was just uh, because my brain works visually anyway. Um, it was a lot easier for me to draw these things out as graphs and charts and maps hmm. to try and remember everything. How many infographics do you know are in the book itself? Uh, it's about 100 and something. Uh, I think I've probably done about 150 in total, including, I mean, the, uh, a good chunk of the stuff that's in the book isn't on the website. Um, so it's about 150 or something. Explain to people who are listening in, at the risk of prompting a very obvious answer, what is an infographic, and, uh, and what do you like about the medium itself? Um, it's uh, information presented graphically, yep. like <laughs> um, charts, graphs, pie charts, Venn diagrams, maps, um, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Why do you like that as a medium? Oh, um, illustrating? I, I think... I think it goes back to that visual nature of my brain. I think everyone has that to a certain extent to to um, to quantify numbers or large periods of time. Um, it's a lot easier to to see to see that visualized for you. You know, it's very difficult to know what you know ten thousand people looks like, but if you compare it in a chart to a thousand people, you know, it makes it easier to see. Or as a, a friend of mine referenced the other day, as we were. Um, having a cup of coffee, He's, he had seen your infographic about the um, the number of pennies stacked one mm -hmm. on the other that would equal a Rod's salary. It yeah, stretches, uh, that some that of the way to the moon. Yeah, uh, yeah, quite a long way to the moon. Actually, I can't remember <laughs> exactly how far it is. But then, yeah, again, that's that's weird. That's kind of the opposite because uh, visualizing you know, a 
a 300 mile high stack of pennies is quite a difficult thing to visualize but then in the context of the size of the planet you know <laughs> when, when you show the size of the two it sort of makes a rod's income seem bigger than mine yeah well thinking about that i mean thinking about a rod who's a polarizing figure in the baseball world mm -hmm. um there's a an aspect to your illustrations that's um sometimes always subtly but sometimes uh subjective perhaps and i'm yeah, curious absolutely. well i'm curious about that about the the commentary that you bring into the illustrations themselves um is that a conscious yeah kind of thing? yeah most of the time i mean the i'm always aware that um if you start presenting statistics even just as numbers but especially when you're using graphs and charts you are it's very difficult to stay objective because you know you can use statistics i mean governments do it all the time use statistics to make their point mm. um and the same set of statistics could be used by the opposition to make their point um i th there's parts of baseball that i really love and there's parts that uh I'm slightly annoyed by um, the Glenn Burke being the only openly gay player. I find that's absurd in the, the length of time that baseball has been around that to only have one player who's out while he was playing seems quite weird. And so if you sort of, that, that number of one player um, sounds like a very small amount, but then if you actually visualize that against all the other players that have ever played in the major leagues, it just sort of, enhances how ridiculous that that amount is. What are some of the other subject areas you've illustrated about that perhaps are parts of the game you find frustrating? Um, I Going back to A-Rod, because you know, we just talked about him and he's on my mind. I, uh, I'm a big fan of him. You know, I think he's a great player, and it's not just because I'm a Yankee fan. Um, uh, and there was the rumor that he had the uh, portrait of himself as a centaur. <laughs> uh, a, a former girlfriend told you know the tabloids that, and um, so just it was kind of mocking of the idea of the uh, the coverage rather than a rod himself to, to 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 look at how a centaur, how good a player a centaur would actually be. I mean, he would be illegally a bat because all of his feet wouldn't be in the batter's box, and <laughs> his range at third would be fairly poor. And I think if he was caught stealing, he might break a leg quite yeah. easily. <laughs> so. But he would also like he would also win any fight with a catcher at the plate. So. Yeah, I think one of my favorites, and it would uh, it also be one of the favorites of my childhood little league coach used to always tell us to put our caps on the right way. Mm. It's a, a very specific step by step diagram of how to remove the sticker from a new cap. Yeah, it's uh, that one uh, when when it sort of got blogged around. Um, you could tell the age of people, I think, from uh, the type of replies. And like, you know, there was a bunch of people who just sort of mocked me and just said, get off my lawn. Um, but then there's people who are, you know, 30 and above who uh, all are still slightly mystified by, you know, wi wearing the tags on your clothes. Yeah. Which that seems to me to be the case. Do you get a lot of comments or retorts from, uh, from fans or, or even from professionals in the baseball world? Um, I get emails and stuff. I mean, the site isn't uh, complexly created. <laughs> complexly probably isn't a word. Uh, it, but there's no sort of comments section or anything. So most of the, uh, the the feedback I get is either via Twitter or emails. Um, people on the whole tend to be pretty positive. Mm. Sometimes they're not, but you know, you learn to forget about those. A lot of people from the UK write to you. Not a huge amount. No, um, I have a couple of friends over here who uh, are fans. Um, I know uh, Matt from Great British Baseball. From Baseball GB. That's the one. Matt Smith. That's him. Mm -hmm. uh, him and I have had a uh, brief email uh, a while back. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think most people over here are still mystified. Yeah, I well that <laughs> might change. That's one of the things we're hoping to do today. What? Um, just one more question about the illustrations themselves. What? is your favorite? Do you have one that, that you kind of prize more than the others you've um, created? I think it goes back to the subjectivity one. There's one about um, the, pop the proportion of Native Americans in the city of Cleveland, which is very, very, very small amount of people. Um, I do find th the fact that that name still exists quite ridiculous, although not as ridiculous as Washington Redskins, but mm. 
it's, uh, it's more the logo than the name, I think. The name could be got away with if they had uh, a logo that was as attractive as a, or respectful as the um, Chicago NHL, the Black Hawks, right. which is a very beautiful piece of work, I think. Mm. But, uh, you know, the, the grinning Indian on the cap seems slightly disrespectful to me. You, um, you seem to have a fascination with team names or the evolution of team names mm -hmm. as well. I mean, and I know that's had a lot of press lately uh, with the really since the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. And uh, that's a big thing here in British baseball. Um, there are teams called the Bolton Robots of Doom. <laughs> um, and, uh, and team names are quite, quite rich in British baseball. Uh, be interesting to see if you have some time to devote to the amateur side of the game, of, uh, mm. taking a look at uh, Yeah, I, re I really would here. like to uh, do some more stuff about British baseball and just uh, non-Major League Baseball in general. Um, I've not really looked at much. I mean, there's something about uh, the history of Japanese baseball and uh, Taiwanese baseball and Korean baseball in the book. But uh, apart from that, I've not, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous really living in Mexico. I've not actually done anything about Mexican baseball yet, which is something, I mean, the most baseball I see is Mexican baseball, so mm. I should do some more. I had um, fun scene in a recent one from uh, you know, a few weeks back about, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, um, uh, Triska Decaphobics, is that? Oh, that yeah. Uh, I've, I've, now, I've only ever seen that written down. Um, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> yeah. So those with uh, an irrational fear of the number 13. Yes. And uh, one of our Team GB players actually appeared on your list, although he oh had really? a Canadian flag next to him because uh, oh. he was born in Vancouver. Right, okay. Mike Nikias of the Mets is a number 13. Ah. Is he in, so he's born in Canada, plays for GB. Uh -huh, so I maybe should change the flag to British then, huh? Well, I think it wouldn't match your, your legend then. It's, uh, I, I, th I think it's fine. It's, I mean, again, like, making the statistics prove your point. The point there was essentially to prove that Venezuelans like the number 13 more than anyone else. Yeah. So. Well, on my team here in the UK, we, I think uh, we had uh, three Latin players who were all fighting over the number 13. Really? I, I suppose it's uh, uh, con uh, Concepcion's number. Yeah. So. They were shortstops or? Quite, yes. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it ended up going to, to one of our shortstops. So. Well, um, what are you working on now? Um, I'm working on lots of British beer. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, nothing much. Um, it's nice to have a bit of a break, sort of mentally, from the game over Christmas and just sort of follow the winter meetings and the trade stuff. Um, but I'm sort of keep making notes of something. I've, I've been working on a, a drawing, um, not an inter infographic, but there's a form of uh, sculpture in Mexico called uh, Arbol de la Vida, which is Tree of Life. Um, and they're very beautiful, elaborate sculptures that originally told the story, Bible stories. Um, but I wanted to sort of like do a drawing of one that was like telling the history of baseball, um, Major League Baseball, um, and choosing three players per decade to represent each decade, but also try and represent each team within this tree and if you to actually keep the number of Yankee players down is very very difficult because you know like the more Yankee players or Red Sox or Cardinals you have then you're losing the opportunity to have a Mets player or something and, and actually just trying to tell the story of each decade by relevant figures is, is quite difficult but it's been sort of nice mental exercise to to work out which I limited myself to three Yankees and which, which three Yankees those should be. And I was speaking to a fellow Yankee fan about that, and we spent a long time deciding whether uh, we should have Mickey Mantle in or not. Um, and it seems like an obvious choice, but then if you choose only three, you've got to have Gehrig, you've got to have Ruth, and you've only got one more. So who should that be? Mm. Went for Billy Martin in the end because I figured that he represents a different type of Yankee dumb hmm. than because Mickey Mantle's kind of you know Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, they're all kind of tied in with that perfect role of the Yankees, hmm. which most people despise. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was uh, it's wonderful to you're welcome. Just talk for a brief time, and um, I know a lot of people here in the UK are going to visit your website for the first time and. Uh, 
and enjoy what they see, it's at flipflopflyin, all one word, dot com. Correct. Flipflopflyin.com, and we'll circulate the link around on Twitter. Can uh, can our fans follow you on Twitter as well if they want? They can. Confusingly, that's flipflopflying with a G at the end. All right. Because <laughs> I just like to make things so much more difficult <laughs> for people. <laughs> Well, I feel all, all much more proud that we actually got to pin you down. Well, you could, talk to you. I think the, the easiest thing, uh, if you're not actually writing anything down, is just craigrobinson.com, and you will find links to all of those bits of silliness. Fantastic. Craig, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you.